get started. I think there's plenty of room to sit around the table. Nika and others. <clears throat> it's it's very difficult. My name is Bani Dugal, and uh, I'm the principal representative here at the Baha'i International Communities United Nations Office, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the launch of uh, our publication, Inciting Hatred, Iran's Media Campaign to Demonize Baha'is. <clears throat> we um, were hoping to have a much larger crowd, but I think we are competing with uh, Security Council elections, a very interesting panel discussion, which when I saw, I thought maybe I'd like to attend that as well on reprisals organized by um, Amnesty International, and the Secretary General is speaking at that panel. So um, when we went around um, on Tuesday to sh share the invitation with some of the media uh, people at the UN, a couple of them even asked if we would consider um, rescheduling it for Monday. But there's never a good day. There's lots of things happening on Monday that would have been a conflict as well. So if uh, some of you haven't uh, heard already, our embargo was broken this morning, and uh, Associated Press has already gone out with a story about this report. So um, it's actually good news, I guess, when AP carries a story, so we are not terribly perturbed by this. But uh, we are actually quite happy that that's gone out, and it should be doing the rounds. So I have it here if anyone would like to uh, take a look at it. So the, uh, the report that we've actually been compelled to put out because the situation became so egregious, I think um, everybody here in the room, perhaps not everybody knows that uh, Baha'is have been persecuted very severely in uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran, particularly since 1979, the, the revolution. And um, <clears throat> the Baha'is are the largest uh, non-Muslim religious minority in the country, but they remain uh, unrecognized. So uh, because of this, they are particularly vul vulnerable to a campaign such as this because they don't have the right of reply. And uh, we are going to uh, take you through um, a short uh, presentation, and my colleague uh, Diana Lai, who's um, who's half Persian and uh, <clears throat> fluent in, in uh, uh, Persian uh, and familiar with the media articles that we've talked about in this report, will uh, share her analysis of what um, the impact of these uh, articles and the media stories and the pictures and cartoons have on the people of Iran, but and particularly for those of us that are um, Baha'is and some of these are sacred places for us and figures and how hurtful some of these reports have been, particularly in light of uh, the, the ongoing persecution in the country. And uh, this report uh, captures an analysis of uh, 400, over 400 uh, pieces that have, were printed in uh, the media and reported in the press and um, mostly in the state and pro-government uh, media. And we've captured it over a 16-month period of time. <clears throat> so it's all of the stuff that we've, we've reported in the report is over just a 16-month period. So I'm going to uh, stop here and invite Diane. Diane Alai is our representative in uh, the Baha'i International Community's UN office in Geneva. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted, before we, we take we walk you through the, the report, to just put the, <clears throat> this report and the issue of inciting hatred in the context, in the larger context of things that take place at the UN, um, particularly in Geneva, but also here in New York, which are things that some of you will be familiar with. And um, <clears throat> all the issues of um, three articles in the um, 
ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 18 that has to deal with, that deals with freedom of religion, Article 19 that deals with freedom of expression, and Article 20 which deals with racism and therefore also incitement to hatred. There has been a lot of um, discussion and um, um, a lot of um, thought that is given and different opinions as to where are the limits of freedom of expression and where are the limits that are respecting religions or that are, you know, inciting to hatred. Um, and as an NGO that represents a faith, as a religious NGOs, as some of them are called. Um, the Baha'i International Committee holds the position that um, freedom of expression is extremely important and that, in fact, um, incitement to hatred and um, the, the curtailing of incitement to hatred and the promotion of freedom of religion or belief come with the promotion of freedom of expression. So this report is not here to say that, you know, we are, um, there is incitement to hatred that has taken place in Iran against the Baha'is, although this is the reality. But I think to put it into the context that the Baha'is in Iran have absolutely no right and they don't have the right to be able to respond to any of those false accusations or um, say any statement, and in fact, even if they want to talk about their beliefs, or if they even say Baha'is, they're sometimes in prison or expelled from university or expelled from public places because they're um, accused of um, proselytizing or um, all sorts of other excuses. So I think that we're we're... We're framing this, um, this report not only within the context of um, information or disinformation, I would say, um, and lies um, against the community, but against the community that has absolutely no right to be able to respond to those rights and to be able to clarify the reality. So it's, a, it's, a, it's doubly um, um, an accusation. And um, yesterday, um, the Mr. Heiner, Professor Heiner Bielefeld, the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief, um, made a very interesting comment, and he said that very often what can be seen um, from a majority um, religions towards minority religions is a combination of fear, which is very interesting because normally it's minorities who should fear majorities, not majorities who should fear minorities, but that's what he said himself. And not only fear, but also contempt. And, um, and I think that this report actually embodies the, these two, these two feelings that very unfortunately, um, the, government of the Islamic Republic of Iran has against members of the Baha'i faith an irrational fear and great contempt. So um, I think um, we'll just start, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, I, well, we'll just walk you through this. We have um, uh, tried to. Um, uh, that I think it would be very nice because, but um, yes. So we have um, we have this. Um, we'll just try to walk you through the document. Yeah. So that um, you have a little bit of a of an overview of what it is. Sure. Go ahead. So this uh, is the first image that we have here for you, and it's you can see it was uh, it has appeared more than once 
on a number of uh, pro-government and anti-Baha'i websites and was used to illustrate <coughs> an 8th of January uh, story this year on uh, the Kalame news site, which claims that Baha'is in Tehran hold meetings on Shia holy days in which men, women, and girls pray to together and then shed their clothing and listen to vulgar music and celebrate. So uh, for those of you that know Baha'is, I mean, you, I don't think it'll be a surprise if we, t if we tell you that this is complete uh, <laughs> nonsense. And in fact, uh, you know, Baha'is are bound to lead a prayerful, ch chaste, good, up uh, upstanding life. And so clearly, this is certainly not something that uh, we even want to defend because it's so ludicrous. But I think Dian can uh, talk to how this would play on the sensibilities of uh, the people of Iran. I don't think that requires much explanation. I mean, you know, you imagine that it's a holy day and, you know, whatever um, uh, belief you hold, if you extrapolize that to your own belief and imagine that people would actually come and celebrate, um, you know, I don't know, the death or I don't know, the crucifixion of Christ to sing, dance, and basically shed their clothes and basically go into orgies, I think that would be highly offensive. There is, I don't think there's much of a question about this. Just I wanted to give an example that I gave to my colleagues about how widespread this, um, these beliefs are and how sometimes um, ruthless are the... Um, the accusations that are held against the Baha'is. I was once um, having a conversation with one of the um, Iranians that was then a member of a UN body. And, uh, and he told me, so he wasn't an official government. He was supposed to be a UN expert on top of it, um, but clearly you know, nominated by the Iranian government to hold that position. And once he told me, yes, um, I have been in Iran in one of your Baha'i meetings. I said, oh, really? He said, yes, and uh, we came, and then they started to shut the curtains, and they turned the lights off. So I told him that I think he had gone to a meeting, but that was not a Baha'i meeting. But just to say that they even dare to face-to-face, -to -face, supposedly you an expert, say such lies. So it's not um, strange that this would actually... Um, and I, I find that photo actually personally not really useful to their to their um, case to their case, to but you know, mm -hmm. hey. And um, stay there. I'll move this. Um, I think one of the thing, one of the reasons why this uh, story, however it might have started, is because the Baha'i community believes in the equality of women and men. And uh, women are not required to be segregated. Women are not required to, um, you know, cover their head, for instance. Of course, in Iran they do because of uh, uh, the law of the land. And uh, Baha'is obey the law of the land wherever they live. But uh, at, uh, the Baha'i faith teaches that women and men are inherently equal. So I think that this is a foreign concept for some, and uh, particularly in Iran. And so the very fact that there's a community where women hold the same kind of uh, um, uh, role as, as men or the importance in the community uh, makes them the imagination fly to all sorts of things. And so, you know, the, we, in, in that context, they also have been portraying Baha'is as being uh, promiscuous, uh, unfortunately. So, in fact, what happened is that we were just trying to look at um, um, the campaigns that were taking place against the Baha'is and just trying to document them. And uh, when they, we came across the sheer number of articles, as you can see from, 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 this, um, from this slide, and in, a, you know, in 16 months' time, so not in a very long period, we decided that you know the, it, it should be publicized, and that was actually it was. We didn't do the research in order to have the the publication, but rather that the publication just came out of the of the information that we gathered because we realized that you know s the number just justified such a publication. And also, since the Baha'is in Iran don't have the right of reply, 
this is our way of um, giving a response to what what has been uh, happening. And uh, this document will be uh, translated, uh, has been translated. We're just finalizing it in Persian. And that will be up on the websites and available widely. And we hope it will also be uh, streamed into uh, Iran how, uh, by media that's outside Iran, because clearly uh, the media in, in Iran will be too fearful to, uh, to publicize this. So this is, um, again, one of the um, articles that you can see. And, I mean, the, the image in of itself is, um, is, uh, is speaking for itself. And, um, yes, and so I think a lot of the, um, a lot of the discussions um, around the Baha'i Faith, and, in fact, it was very interesting because um, we had a presentation at the Human Rights Council by... Um, uh, a researcher, and, and we found out that, you know, the Iranian government is actually using that not only against the Baha'is, but against other um, uh, religious minorities. And, um, and, and so it, it really, and as you will see, we will go through it, it really highlights every point that is very sensitive within the Iranian psyche. So it's not just by chance that those, um, those terms or those qualifications, you know, of trying to subvert Islam, trying to change the religion so that it actually plays with the cultural context of how Iranians identify themselves with religion, with their cultures, with the behavior as, it, as was mentioned by Bani. And, and these, these various points are being taken out and subverted to say that, you know, the Baha'is do this and that so that it really has an effect on your average Iranian who doesn't know, maybe has not been able to be in contact with Baha'is, doesn't know any Baha'i, which, which could happen, and so therefore doesn't have any reason not to believe what is fed to them, particularly when it's such large numbers. And through various media, as you have seen in the previous slide, it's not only websites, it's not only articles, it's also TV programs, it's also radio things, it's also conferences, pamphlets, we will see all that. The, um, I think the turning point of the whole, um, of the whole, um, um, uh, campaign, um, was that statement that was made by the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khomeini. So if you, if you know a little bit Iran, you will know that the Supreme Leader is really the man in command in Iran. I mean, I think that perhaps the West portrays the President, Mr. Ahmadinejad, as the uh, embodiment of the Islamic Republic, he's the president. But at the end of the day, uh, the supreme leader is um, the man that gives the spiritual guidance and the political guidance to Iran, and so he is the most top person in the country. And so his statement is actually anal are analyzed, and, um, and, uh, and, and, and the fact that he went in the city of Qom, which is the most... Um, holy city in Iran for Shia Islam. And he made that statement um, where he identified the Baha'is as uh, enemies of the Republic was for sure a signal that, you know, these campaigns and these decisions are not just random and they're very well organized and they are um, and they get instructions from the highest level within um, within the government of the Islamic Republic. So as you can see, Khamenei said, uh, Iran's enemies seek to weaken the pillars of people's faith by promoting immorality, which again, you saw the way the media chose to portray that. False Sufism, promotion of Baha'ism, Baha I can barely say that, and promotion of home-based churches. And this again is a reference to the fact that Baha'is don't have clergy. And uh, we meet in prayer in people's homes, um, in uh, small communities, even where I live. That's how we gather together every 19 days to pray. And uh, or 
even um, more frequently than that uh, on, on an informal basis. And uh, so this is, uh, you know, his way of referencing that, um, uh, you know, people who do uh, act like that are Iran's enemies, and they're weakening the pillars of people's faith by inviting their neighbors in to say prayers with them, apparently. And uh, again, these uh, remarks were further amplified in the coming days by other commentators. So you, just as Diane mentioned, everyone's taking their cues from the supreme leader, and then the other government officials start to make comments. And the, some of them that were made are that the Baha'is are a colonial sect, this, again, has been a long-standing accusation that uh, Iranian government has made, and that they are the, uh, the persons responsible for the sedition after the 2009 presidential election. Now, you saw there were millions of people out on the streets, etc. I mean, to think that Baha'is, who are already uh, um, uh, marginalized to the extent that they are and persecuted, would be able to, you know, bring all the people of Iran out onto the streets is, uh, you know, pretty surprising. And then more absurdly, he said that uh, Baha'is had joined with the anti-Baha'i Hujatiye Society in opposing the government. Now, the Hujatiye Society is a society that was set up when? In the 50s? In the 1950s. And it was a, a, a means by which um, uh, s certain uh, people in the clergy and possibly um, even uh, politicians tried to weaken the Baha'i community and to uh, to uh, to attack the Baha'i community. And uh, this Hujatiya society went underground when the Islamic Republic of Iran first came into being, and then it's been revived since and has been actively uh, promoting anti-Baha'i propaganda. So to think that Baha'is would collude with the Hujatiya society to work against the government again, I mean, you know, so that even their statements aren't consistent with what they're actually trying to say and, and clearly prove that, uh, you know, that they'll use any means to attack the Baha'is and make us look uh, bad in that country. Just one more thing about the um, colonial sect. Um, there, is a, there is a belief in Iran, like in many uh, uh, Middle Eastern countries, of conspiracy theories and of you know, countries, particularly the U.S. or the U.K., always having a hand between every uh, – a hand in every uh, – you know, bad thing that happens in the country. And so I think that this is again playing um, in, into and tapping into this conspiracy theories and thinking and saying that, you know, Baha'is were, are actually agents of, you know, and in fact they're sometimes contradictory because we're sometimes agents of the Russians and then we're agents of the British and then we're agents of the Americans. We have um, great capacities to be agents of everybody. Um, but I think this is also the same, um, the, the, same, um, the same rhetoric that is used again and tapping into this, um, these, um, these things that are sensitive for the Iranian uh, people. So um, I think that there as I said, I mean, it, we, we see a, a, the various uh, uh, possibilities of, uh, you know, using any, any, anything that, that, that would be useful. Uh, I think Mr. Larijani um, used it uh, during the Universal Periodic Review against the Baha'is, um, you know, giving a response saying that the Baha'is are a cult. So that, in fact, you know, people can believe in their hearts, but when they engage in cult-like practices, um, they have to, you know, they have to be taken, um, actions have to be taken against them um, in the, you know, by, by the authorities. Interestingly, he then went on to define what he thought was a cult. And he said that, you know, it's somewhere where you can enter, but you cannot leave. In the Baha'i faith, you can actually enter and you can also leave. But I think there's some other religions in Iran where people are condemned to death for apostasy. But that's just a contradiction of the Iranian authorities as usual. 
Now this is uh, the shrine of Bahá'u'lláh. It's the holiest spot on earth for Baha'is. It's the point of adoration. It's um, a place of pilgrimage and one that Baha'is river and we go and we pray there and you know as you can see it's a very beautiful um, tranquil place and uh, unfortunately the way the media portrayed it um, and you can show that so this is how it was uh, used the image uh, to illustrate some of the articles that they had written. So you can imagine, I mean, uh, imagine if uh, the Kaaba was portrayed in such a light or if uh, the Vatican, uh, the Sistine Chapel was portrayed in such a light or, you know, any other religious site around the world, what an outrage that would create. And, you know, they didn't even think uh, about how this might be so hurtful to uh, to Baha'is around the world. We'll go back to the real shrine of Baha'u'llah. I think, again, beyond the, um, <coughs> the hurtfulness that it may be for Baha'is, I think what is more painful is that there is no way for Baha'is to redress this. I, I, I will repeat it again. We, we firmly believe in freedom of expression. And people have the right to challenge any belief, we think. And if people want to challenge beliefs of the Baha'i faith, they're totally entitled to do so. But first of all, we don't really believe that, believe that this form of photos are a challenge of our belief, but rather just an insult and just there to be an insult. But on top of it, I mean... We stand ready to be challenged. Let us just give us the opportunity to respond to that challenge, which is something that is not given to us in Iran. So again, um, of course, one of the other, as you will all know, if you know a little bit Iran and the statements by Mr. Ahmadinejad and others, clearly the links to Israel and Zionism um, will be something that would be extremely um, putting doubts in people's minds and creating um, hatreds, particularly if, if people become agents um, of a foreign country. Um, this is based on the fact that the Baha'i holy places, um, the shrine of Baha'u'llah that you have seen just before, is in Israel. Um, the Baha'i holy places are in Israel, like actually many other holy places. Um, they're all in Israel. The holy places for the Christians are in Israel. Holy places for the Jews are in Israel. Holy places for the Muslims are in Israel. And, um, and the fact that the holy places for the Baha'is are in Israel uh, come from the fact that Baha'u'llah was exiled by two Muslim governments, the Qajar Iran and the Ottoman Empire of Turkey, to what was then Palestine, the most remote province of the Ottoman Empire, into the most um, isolated and filthy um, um, a fortress of the Ottoman Empire in the city of Acre at the time, which is called now Akko in Hebrew and Akka in Arabic. And Baha'u'llah was imprisoned there, and that's where just outside of there in that house where he was under house arrest that he passed away, and that's why our holy places are there. So, you know, if all Baha'is are Zionists because their holy places are in Israel, then therefore all Christians are also Zionists with the same logic. So, um, but, you know, it's used like that, and um, it is, um, um, again, one of the tools that the Iranian government uses. Again, um, you can see in this uh, slide, one of the accusations they make is that Baha'is have been sending water coolers to hot areas of the country. Like, that's a really egregious act to attract young Adults. I mean, I, I think the government should be doing that if they aren't, and if, if uh, the Baha'is are doing it, it's in service. But uh, it carries on with other uh, accusations similar to the ones that we uh, showed you earlier about Baha'is serving alcoholic drinks and dancing, etc. And again, um, <clears throat> Baha'is don't uh, uh, drink alcohol. So again, it's, it's I mean, we are... Uh, 
just, I mean, it's not surprising that they would come up with all kinds of accusations. And then we go back to um, other accusations that, of course, the um, government has been using more recently. And this is to be that the Baha'is are actually behind um, um, the, um, the, the anti, well, the uh, protests after the elections, but also uh, a number of, um, of human rights defenders or other um, people who are in op opposition with the government are um, now accused of being Baha'is, as if being a Baha'i is a crime. So I think here it's actually, again, a double way of of um, of using this um, this uh, these accusations because they they feel that they're actually diminishing the the, the position of I don't know Mrs. Shirin Ebadi or I don't know Mr. Mohajirani, Mr. Kadivar because they 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 call them Baha'is, but also that in fact they're turning the fact of being a Baha'i into a crime because okay they're not Baha'is but even if they were. So what? So I think this is um, a very, in, again, very smart manipulation. Ah, and of course, BBC and Voice of America, I forgot. So, of course, um, the two main TV channels that broadcast to Iran in Persian, that the Iranians watch so that they can watch something different from, you know, state-sponsored television that, you know, tells lies, of course, are behind um, behind, I mean, the Baha'i faith is behind them. Even, I think there was a, um, um, the former um, uh, Speaker of the Parliament who actually said, you know, BBC stands for Baha'i Broadcasting Company. I mean, you, you can imagine that a person with such a rank would say such stupidities, I'm sorry, but that's all it can be, um, is quite remarkable. Well, these are just uh, of the, you can see the numbers of the four, 400 uh, articles and how they are categorized, the number of articles that cite these. Can you read it all the way at the back? So then I don't have to explain it. And it will be in the, in the document as well. And then finally, and this is Diane's favorite. Well, I don't know. Um, I think that, you know, you see that the, the manipulation is so great that it actually even goes to school children so and so you know it starts with school children and um, the um, the precursor of um, of the founder of, of the Baha'i faith Baha'u'llah is a, was called himself the Bab which means in in uh, in, per, in Arabic the door so it means the door leading to to Baha'u'llah and uh, he came from Shiraz and um, this booklet is about uh, a little boy called Babak, which means the little door, um, and is actually just completely masquerading and making fun and, and in a very humiliating way the life of one of the main figures of the Baha'i faith, but that's for school children, and it was distributed as a gift at the end of the school year. And so basically, I mean, this is the the unfortunate result of such campaign is that it does result in acts of violence, and we have seen acts of violence against the Baha'is, you know, in assault on individuals, in arsons, in vandalisms, in graffitis, in desecrations of cemeteries, and so on and so forth. And again, I think the most, and it was very interesting because um, at the beginning of the week, um, the Human Rights Committee was... Um, having to deal with the report of the Iranian government and its compliance on the covenant on civil and political rights. And in fact, one of the experts asked the question of the Iranian government to, of course, they didn't respond to it, saying, well, you know, in, no, in any country when there are graffitis, immediately, you know, the next day, the government does something to cover them up. It seems that when there are graffitis in Iran against the Baha'i that call them the spies or traitors, um, the government is quite happy about them and doesn't do anything, and they stay on and on forever on their, on, you know, on their homes. And so I think that it's not so much the graffiti themselves, but the treatment and the response that comes officially from the government that is appalling. 
So uh, we'll take some questions here. There's one last uh, slide that we wanted to show you. Uh, and this is actually published on the Revolutionary Guard website that uh, talks about how uh, Baha'is, the Baha'ism sect is uh, distributing misguided materials on the internet. Um, and I guess that's a depiction of, I don't know, I can barely tell. <laughs> so um, at this point, we'll take some questions.